Welcome to the Foundation for Enhancing Communities Early Learning Conference, and thank you for joining me for the session, Establishing and Cultivating Family Partnerships. My name is Andrea Laum, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you what I've learned about developing relationships with families through both my experiences and through research. Throughout our time together, you'll see that I have included several questions on the slides. Of course, I'd love to hear your responses, but since I can't, I'd encourage you to pause the session, jot down a few notes for yourself, and talk about your ideas with a colleague. During our time together, we're going to consider our perceptions of families and the impact of our perceptions. We'll examine professional resources related to family partnerships learn strategies for developing reciprocal relationships with families, evaluate the effectiveness of our communication with families, review types of family engagement, and discover additional resources. This is a topic I'm especially passionate about. Before my current role as Early Childhood Supervisor for the Lebanon County Head Start Program, which is part of IU13, I worked for a Community Innovation Zone grant this CIZ grant provided me with many opportunities to learn more about family engagement, as well as explore strategies to connect with families. We often assume that school is the main place that learning is going to happen, but children actually spend 82% of their waking hours at home or in their community. All those weekends, weeknights, and breaks really add up. According to the Flamboyant Foundation, a strong body of research shows that students do better in school and in life when parents and schools are equal partners in a child's education. So what important words do we see in this quote? First, focus on the word research. That means it's not just our idea that children need families to be involved. Research documents how important it is. Think of the phrase, in life. Children don't just do better in school, but in life. Research shows that students with engaged families also have stronger social skills and fewer disciplinary issues. This conference is focused on school readiness. We know family engagement in the early years contributes to a successful transition to kindergarten, but again, Research shows the impact of families' involvement in their children's education extends way beyond kindergarten. In the quote again, the word parents. Take a look at that word. We prefer to use the word families. It's a more inclusive term that honors all adult caregivers who make a difference in a child's life. I've heard that one time a grandparent said, I didn't think I could come because it was a parent-child activity. Families can be biological or non-biological, chosen or circumstantial. They're connected through culture, languages, traditions, shared experiences, emotional commitment, and mutual support. In the quote, see the phrase equal partners? We need to be open to learning from families as they also learn from us. The basic movement aims to help every family, help every child reach their full potential. The five basic principles are maximize love, manage stress, talk, sing, and point, count, group, and compare, explore through movement and play, and read and discuss stories. Our relationships with families can increase their capacity and their effectiveness in their role as their child's first teacher, or our interactions with families may inadvertently lead to feelings of incompetence or inadequacy. When I see families outside at arrival waiting to drop off their children and they're playing games like I spy, I love to encourage them. They're building connections in their child's brain. When families are struggling with meeting basic needs, they need to be reminded of how meaningful their everyday interactions with their children are. 
we have a powerful role to play, not only with children, but also with their families. Before we get into specific family engagement strategies, I'm going to take a few minutes reviewing how some professional documents guide our work with families. We'll look at the Pennsylvania Early Learning Standards, the section called Partnerships for Learning. We'll look at NACI's Code of Ethical Conduct and the Danielson Framework. As I share, consider what can we learn from this document about our role and how does it impact your work? When we talk about the Pennsylvania Early Learning Standards, we usually think about what children know and are able to do in areas such as literacy, math, and science. I find that teachers often aren't familiar with the key learning area called Partnerships for Learning. These standards are included because of the understanding that these partnerships are critical in a holistic approach to children's learning. Here's an example of one of the seven Partnerships for Learning, or PL standards. Like the other standard areas, you'll see big ideas and essential questions to consider. You'll also see supportive practices of programs and professionals, what we can do, and what families will experience through their child's participation in an early childhood program. PL3, includes the important facts that the bond between the child and family is the stable connector throughout a child's life. And families benefit from having ongoing support to learn about and understand their children's development. So we need to consider what we can do to equip families with the information and skills they need to support their child's growth and development. We also need to build their confidence in their role. At one school, we decided to have a family resource center. The idea was that families could stop in the family resource center and get information about parenting and resources. The problem was that we did not have a room or space for the family resource center. Well, our creative group did some problem solving and decided to put the family resource center on a cart. On Thursdays after school, the cart was just outside the cafeteria where families came to pick up their power packs, their power packs with meals for the weekend. During conferences, the cart was in the school lobby and on movie night, it was right by the snacks. The resource center not only had information, but also books and games that families could borrow. This was a fun and creative way to address Partnership for Learning, standard number three. Another PL standard, seven, states that families are supported in times of transition. This includes transitions both into our classrooms and or our programs, as well as transitions into kindergarten. Here's an example. Just recently, we had a new child visit one of the classes that I supervise. The child didn't want to enter the room, even with his family accompanying him. This was just a visit. He wasn't even starting yet. Can you guess how his parents felt? Maybe embarrassed that he was screaming and wouldn't move away from the door. A staff member offered to create a social story for him. She'll take pictures of the classroom and the teachers. The family can read the story with him before he starts and help him become more com comfortable. That not only helps the child in this time of transition, but also the family. NACI, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, has developed a code of ethical conduct that provides guidance for pro professional behavior and sets a foundation for resolving ethical dilemmas that may be encountered in our field of early childhood education. The code has defined four areas of professional relationships, our responsibilities with children, with families, among colleagues, and with the community and society. Ideals in the code refer to our aspirations. What is exemplary practice in this area? And principles guide our conduct 
and assist us in resolving these ethical dilemmas. Here's an example. Say a parent of a preschooler in your program is concerned that her child will not be ready for kindergarten next year. And that parent talked with other parents who have the same concern. The group of parents has a copy of the kindergarten placement test, and they want you to begin preparing children and deliver the test before the end of the year. Well, they want their children to succeed in school. So we go back to principle 2.2. We shall inform families of program philosophy, policies, curriculum, assessment systems, etc., and which are in according with our ethical responsibilities to children, which goes back to section one of the Code of Ethical Conduct. So in this situation, the teacher needs to explain to the parents how she assesses the children to determine where they are and to direct them to where they need to be to get ready for kindergarten. The teacher needs to be considerate of the parents' concern and accept their, consider their suggestions for deliberation. When you're dealing with a challenging situation like this, and it feels like an ethical dilemma, go to the NACI Code of Ethical Conduct for guidance. Another document that includes expectations regarding family engagement is the Danielson Framework. School districts and pre-K count programs use it as an observation and evaluation tool. Family engagement falls under Domain 4, Professional Responsibilities. Examples of each level include, proficient would be using weekly newsletters that include information about current and upcoming class activities. Also, monthly progress reports for individual students or projects sent home for families to work on together. In the distinguished level, we'll see teachers doing things like having students create materials to show families what they're learning, and children share ideas for newsletters. It is our professional responsibility to both be aware of barriers to developing relationships with families and work through them. One barrier could be a lack of trust. Maybe a parent remembers negative experiences from his or her own schooling, and she carries them with her when she talks with you, the child's teacher. Other barriers might be parental stress or mental health challenges. We can help reduce parental stress by developing warm relationships and encouraging peer-to-peer -peer support. It is our professional responsibility and ethical responsibility, referring back to the NACI code, to avoid judgment show empathy and a caring attitude, and use active listening with our families. Throughout my career, I have continued to learn keys for developing effective partnerships with families. Now, when I pulled up images of keys, I realized how different they all are, different shapes and indentations and sizes. So why am I sharing this? Just like the images of keys are all different, each family we work with is unique, and we need to respond to each family the way that will best help them build a reciprocal relationship with us. Also, when we say keys, we might not be talking about the same thing. I might be thinking of a car key, and someone who works with technology may be thinking of a computer keyboard, or a musician might think of a piano keyboard. Now let's dive into some of these keys for developing reciprocal relationships with families and cultivating partnerships. Our first key encourages us to consider our perspective about working with families and our perceptions of families. After this session, I'd encourage you to go to YouTube and watch a seven minute video entitled My Beautiful Woman. The video helps us to see difficult decisions that families may need to make. Recently, a teacher told me about a family's home that was terribly dirty. She said at first she felt anger and judgment. How could they put their child in this situation? But later, she considered the parents' perspective. She realized that they felt embarrassment and shame, but they still welcomed her into the house. Whatever strategies we implement, 
to develop family partnerships will not be successful without considering our perceptions. Maybe we have a child in our classroom who screams when things don't go his way. We may want to jump to a conclusion. At home, when he screams, he gets whatever he wants. But there could be many different reasons for this child's reaction, including too much sensory stimulation or an unknown connection traumatic, to traumatic experience or experiences that may trigger this response. You may have seen this visual of an iceberg before. I'd like you to think of it in relationship to what we know about the families of our children. We see the family's behavior, either bringing a child to school on time or arriving late almost every day. What we don't see are the family's values, beliefs, and worldviews. It takes time and an ability to be open to the uniqueness of each family to discover more about them. Key number two, when we view families through a strength-based lens, we consider their funds of knowledge. This term refers to the knowledge base that families have based on their experiences, their social practices, and their social histories. We don't wanna focus on families' deficits, such as what they aren't doing, what they don't have, and what their gaps and challenges are. We don't wanna see families as people that educators need to manage. Rather, it's important to consider what assets family members bring to their educational process. Each family has unique strengths that can be the foundation of our discussions and our partnerships. Now, adopting a strength-based attitude does not mean avoiding challenges. Instead, it shows families that we wanna to work together with them to find a solution. The resources I provided in the handouts is called Exploring Cultural Concepts, Funds of Knowledge. It has an activity that you can do with colleagues as you consider your own funds of knowledge. In addition to considering the funds of knowledge that your families and children bring to your classrooms every day. These funds of knowledge include what household chores families do, they might do with their children at home what outings they go on together, and the friends and family members they spend time with. Key number three is learn from families. This also relates to funds of knowledge. Consider what you can learn from a family. If families can't come into the classroom, they could audio or video record themselves singing a favorite song together, maybe even in their home language. It's important for us to view families as contributors and creators, as well as partners. Key number four, never give up. One of my first years of teaching, I had a conversation with Daniel's dad. In the evening, I received a call from an angry parent. Although he disagreed with how I handled a playground incident, I continued to keep open lines of communication. And at the end of the year, the father expressed his appreciation. You see, Daniel came to school with a long stem rose and said, here, this is for you. I said, why Daniel? He said, my dad told me to give it to you. I saw the value of never giving up, even though the father was really angry and upset with me. More recently, a teacher I supervised called me to discuss a concern. The day after what seemed like a very minor incident, the mother came to school and seemed very cold and standoffish. The teacher asked what seemed like an innocent question, do we have a problem? The mother responded, do we? I asked the teacher to consider the mother's perspective. The mother had just regained custody of her child. I wonder if she assumed that she would be judged and the teacher's simple question may have led to her feeling defensive. E number five, communication matters. Back when I was teaching first grade, a mother and grandmother who came together to a parent-teacher conference did not look happy. 
although the daughter was doing well in school. The grandmother asked, why don't you teach phonics? I asked her to clarify what she meant. And when she did, I was able to provide her with more information about our first grade reading program that included many phonetic strategies. I also asked the mother and grandmother if there are any other strategies they'd like me to use to support their daughter's beginning reading. I avoided becoming defensive, although I might have felt defensive for a little bit, but I asked instead a clarifying question and I was open to new ideas. We use both formal and informal strategies for connecting with families. Formal strategies are conferences and informal strategies are our regular conversations at drop off and pick up, as well as sending short notes home. Sometimes it may be hard for families to understand our play-based approach to learning. In the handouts for this session, I've included an article that you might find helpful called Explaining DAP or Developmentally Appropriate Practices to Parents. Another way that communication matters is through everyday situations and our daily interactions. Years ago, I learned that anything I say may be silencing to someone else. Listen to that again. Anything I say may be silencing to someone else. Does that mean I don't say anything that might be difficult? Of course not, but I do wanna consider what and how I share information. I wanna make sure I'm not approaching a family member with a fixed or negative attitude that may convey judgment and put up barriers to engaging that person without even realizing it. Also, it's common for families to think that the only time they hear from their child's school is when it's bad news. It's important that our first and frequent calls and texts to families are positive. We're going to review some statements and rewrite them to make the communication more effective and promote a positive relationship. It's hard to always say things in a helpful way that lead to positive dialogue, but practice helps. This first statement, Jamie had a difficult day. I don't know about you, but for me, it seems like a lot of my days are filled with both things that go well and things that are difficult. Instead, we wanna be specific about Jamie's day. We could say, Jamie really enjoyed center time. She played with three friends and shared the blocks the whole time. At the end of center time, Jamie was having so much fun that she didn't wanna clean up. Another child was picking up the blocks and Jamie didn't like that, so she bit her. We're asking Jamie to say stop when someone is doing something that she doesn't like. I can also share with the family examples of other strategies we're using with Jamie, such as giving her a warning before cleanup time or having her look at a timer. This not only helps the family to better understand the child's day, but it also shares ideas that they might want to try at home. Families want reassurance that my child won't be singled out labeled, forgotten, or harmed, especially when they're struggling with challenging behaviors. Our next example is Samuel is doing just fine. Although that's a positive statement, it doesn't provide a family with information about Samuel's abilities and his learning. Instead, be specific, say, I noticed that Samuel counted 20 blocks as he stacked them into a tower. Too often our comments are about children's behavior, but families also want to know what their children know and are able to do. Consider if your communications with families are focused more on behaviors or on their learning. Key number six is take time to connect and learn about the family's culture. Positive parent-child interactions may look quite distinct in different families. Culture influences caregiving styles, playful interactions, and responses to children. One morning, I was outside of school inviting families with younger siblings into the school 
for an infant toddler story time. I started talking to a toddler who was in a stroller. The mother, who said she's from China, explained to me she doesn't understand you. I said, that's okay. Even though she doesn't understand me, she can still tell that I'm interested in talking to her and she's smiling. Those interactions led to the mother bringing the child into the school for an infant toddler story time. Later, she wanted to come to another session, but she realized she had forgotten her ID at home. She said to the, me, here, you take her in. And although, of course, I couldn't take her in and take the child into the um, school without the mother, I did appreciate that I spent time with that family and that relationship helped her to feel comfortable enough that she wanted her child to participate even if she couldn't. The story had a happy ending. The mom went home and got her ID and they were able to join the session again. Families of all types can raise thriving children. It's the nature and quality of the relationships in each family that is most important for children's healthy development. These interactions are rooted in families' belief systems and cultural identities. When connecting with families, consider their cultural preferences. We want to ask, not just assume. Would you prefer a phone call or an email? It's important to consider each family's culture as we communicate with them, but not also generalize. Another family with a Chinese heritage might have a completely different perspective on those interactions. It's important for us to be open to family suggestions and requests so that we can do our best on behalf of children. I read a story about a preschool program being responsive to a family's cultural preferences that I'll always remember. You see, the family had a Middle Eastern background and heritage, and they had um, a concern about their child playing with the sand. The teacher went a little deeper and said, what's your concern? Because you see, the classroom had a really big sandbox outside, and all the children loved playing in the sand. The challenge was the teacher wanted to offer that learning experience, a sensory opportunity to the child, but also wanted to respect the family's wishes of the child not playing in the sand. So as they started talking, the teacher learned that the issue was the family didn't want the child to get sand in their hair. So they came up with a creative solution. The teacher gave all the children shower caps. So anytime it was their turn to play in the sand, they would go to the hook get their shower cap and put it on. All the children thought it was something wonderful and something special. What turned out as a great opportunity to include all children just started as a way of being responsive to different cultural preferences. Understanding a family's culture takes curiosity, patience, commitment, and a willingness to feel uncomfortable at times. It also takes courage and humility to reflect on our own experiences and understand how they affect our attitudes towards families. But it's always worth it. Key number seven is know and share resources. This picture reminds me of a teacher I was working with just a few years ago during a winter month. When the mom dropped off our preschooler, she was crying as she told the teacher that they had slept in their car that evening. After greeting all the children and starting them on their welcoming activities, the teacher reached out to someone who could help connect the family to housing. By the end of the day, when the child was picked up, the mom shared with the teacher that that resource person had talked with her, made arrangements, and they would not need to sleep in the car again that night. When a family is facing a tough time, we can also help them focus on resilience we can say, I know this is hard, and I know you're strong and we'll get through it. We can help families focus on both their progress made and the possibilities ahead. Think of what resources are available in your community, medical, economic, and other social services. Maybe your family might need educational resources like getting a GED or language services or behavioral support. 
to call 911 in an emergency. But are you familiar with 211? When someone calls 211, a specialist connects the caller with resources in their community. This could be help with a utilities bill, if a family can't pay their electric bill and are worried about the heat getting shut off, housing assistance, or access to food or employment services. The goal of 211 is to make the network of social services more efficient and to assure that more people in need are connecting to the agencies that can help them. Do you know different types of resources? If not, think about who you can ask. I'd encourage you to have lists easily accessible that you can share with families. But of course, if you're not sure, you can always suggest that the family call 211. Key number eight, provide a variety of opportunities for family engagement. When working on that CIZ grant that I mentioned earlier, we were able to have a family engagement focus group. This is when families share their ideas of how they might be able to be involved in their children's school, from reading stories to bringing a guitar to sing with their children. Notice the picture in the top corner is of a pavilion. You may think that's odd. What does a family engagement focus group have to do with a pavilion? Well, I was trying to figure out when we could have this family engagement focus group to get families to attend. Someone suggested to me that a lot of families come to Coleman's Park for field day. So when the children had field day, they had some children in the morning, some in the afternoon, but between the sessions, the families had a break. So I set up a lunch during this pavilion and during lunch, families came, enjoyed their lunch, and talked with us about ways they can want to be involved in the community, the school community, that is. You'll see another article in the, in the handouts called Engaging Activities for Whole Family Nights. In the grant, we were able to try different types of family engagement activities. One event we tried that families didn't attend very well was after school. The children went to a room for childcare and the parents learned strategies to help their children with literacy, their parent training. That did not get a good response, so we tried a different type of activity. When we had an event where families did the activities with their children, we had a much better response. We just asked families to come a little bit earlier rather than the regular dismissal time, and the end of the school day was doing a parent-child activity that also promoted literacy. We can't make assumptions about a family's interest and support of their child's education based on their help with homework assignments or their participation at conferences. There are many different ways of involving families. Here you see a list of six types of family involvement that was developed by Joyce Epstein. It begins with basic parenting but down to ways to be involved, such as decision-making in the school and being part of the community. We also come back to cultural expectations. At the end of the year, we had some celebrations and they were much bigger than we had anticipated. A parent said to me, well, of course you would have good participation for this event. She said when she lived in Puerto Rico, at the end of every year, it was like a graduation ceremony moving on to the next school year. That gave me a good perspective on how important it is to engage families at the time when it's most meaningful to them. As our time together is coming to a close, I'd like you to consider your experiences establishing and cultivating family partnerships. Consider what do you enjoy most about working with the families of the children you serve? What do you find challenging about working with families? And what strategies have you found to be effective in developing partnerships? Also consider, do all families care about their children's education? How do I know? Sure, it might look different, but it doesn't mean the family doesn't care. Different isn't wrong. What is the impact of different child rearing practices on families and on the homeschool relationships? 
How could teachers build partnerships with families to achieve both the parents' goals and the teachers' goals, even when they're different? Henry Ford is famous for this quote, though we could also relate to our work with families. He said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is a success. We need to be aware that economic, educational, and other gaps between teachers and parents may sometimes make it challenging to build true partnerships. I think it's very helpful how Doug Edwards from the organization Real Dads Forever sees relationships with families like a spider web. There must be hundreds of connecting strands on a spider web. Every connection we create with families makes that web stronger and better. Whether we experience social, racial, or education gaps with the families we serve, we can close those gaps and build stronger relationships with families by being vulnerable, sharing a few pieces of personal information about ourselves, and taking the time to really get to know families. Let's conclude our time together with a poem that you may have heard before called Unity. I dreamt I stood in a studio and watched two sculptors there. The clay they used was a young child's mind and they fashioned it with care. One was a teacher and the tools he used were books, music, and art. One a parent with a guiding hand and a gentle loving heart. Day after day, the teacher toiled with a touch that was deft and sure while the parent labored by his side and polished and smoothed it o'er. And when at last their work was done, they were proud of what they had wrought, for the things they had molded into the child could neither be sold nor bought. And each agreed they would have failed if each had worked alone, for behind the parent stood the school and behind the teacher, the home. Thank you for joining me for this session today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference.